On today's episode of On The Line, we have Chef Roy Choi. A dear friend, uh, an amazing chef, and a culinary trendsetter. LA royalty. A man who has helped to put food trucks on the road and now he's bringing his tacos to the street. He is going to meet the people face to face and he's gonna tell us, well, how he's done it, where he's going, and. Uh, and where to find his delicious tacos. Growing up as a Korean immigrant, going to the Culinary Institute of America, to starting the chef-driven food truck craze, and then of course being in Hollywood and starring in the movie Chef. Welcome, Chef Roy Choi. On the line. Okay. Okay. okay no more laughing. Oh, wait, why? No, <laughs> let's be serious. Okay. <laughs> Why? Is this a Good serious podcast? Serious. No, so, no, absolutely oh, not. No, no. Yeah, it's the very intro. serious. But Dan's yeah. going to do the. Yeah, his... no, I, I wrote a little thing because I wanted to introduce folks that um, don't know who you are. Oh, yeah. I, I even wrote that. I said, for those of you who don't know who Roy Y'all don't is, know who I am? I yeah. can't believe there's anybody in He's this He's ain't got no love. The next for line says, it's time to crawl out from under whatever rock you've been hiding under. <laughs> That's perfect. If you don't know. Yeah. So Roy's a, a huge and meaningful impact on the dining scene here in Los Angeles and the culinary industry as a whole, right? Agreed? Um, first and foremost, Roy's a chef's chef, a guy you can find cooking alongside his team. He may hang out with the celebrisset. But uh, don't let that fool you. The man, uh, the man can throw down with the pots and pans. Um, and secondly, Roy is an author, a TV personality, an entrepreneur. But most importantly, he's an extraordinarily loyal friend and father, a husband, and uh, a business partner. He keep all the people that he's ever known or worked with. St he still knows and works with. It's like very unique in your world. Absolutely. Um, and he's an un unwavering uh, community activist, a dedicated philanthropist. And someone who puts their money where their mouth is, and uh, he lives the life that they preach, which is special as well. So as a chef, Roy took a huge career risk 15 years ago. 15 years ago? This is the 16th year. Yeah. 16 years ago. He had worked his way up in the hotel industry, holding a leadership role at a big box hotel can be a very rewarding job. Good stable hours, good stable pay. Um, it can be fulfilling leading a large team and feeding a lot of people every single day. Uh, and with plenty of long-term upside, but Roy uh, had put his time in and he'd grown through the ranks and finally was in a position to be, you were, you were like in a position to be in the leadership role of one of those big box hotels and do that, but he was not fulfilled with the work and he decided to give it up and start, well, lower than the bottom rung. He started outside of the kitchen in a uh, and gave up his restaurant in exchange for a food truck, which is like... Uh, now cool thing to do right at when the time, you right yeah. at the time no at one the time no one was doing that so at the time the food trucks uh were, were served a completely utilitarian purpose construction workers and uh lunch and l construction workers lunch and um uh quick and cheap and easy meals for people on the go there were a few fancy uh, food trucks up in the pacific northwest but nothing that would give a family man the confidence to gamble his hotel salary on opening one <laughs> and that said roy is a gambler which is another piece of the puzzle. Um, and uh, the gamble paid off. And there's a ton of info about Kogi and the impact and its success. And it's still going. And you can go get the delicious tacos. And I, I learned about perilla leaves there, which was a thing. And they're delicious. Um, uh, uh, but it took off. And um, uh, you can look it up. <laughs> I'm not going to go on. Is this but, a podcast that tells yeah, people to Google yeah, it? Yeah. Just yeah, Google, Google it. it. <laughs> but um, uh, time has proven that this success was not a gimmick. So this is a piece of the puzzle that I think is important about Roy, is that there's something very special boy, about him. And um, uh, it's kept Kogi alive and running, along with the amazing team that, that, uh, that, you, that you surround mm -hmm. yourself with. Um, and mm -hmm. the special thing that has continued to propel your success across all of your endeavors. And from nearly 30, I've known you for like almost 30 years. So, 97, yeah. right? So yeah. 27 years. So for 27 years of observation, what I can say is that the special and unique thing is that you, you are authentically yourself, right? Which means that you approach your work uh, true to yourself and that um, you put it out there for people to judge and accept as it, as, it, as it is. So you're like, this is something I like. This is who I am. And mm -hmm. go fuck yourself. Um, we, <laughs> we came up in an era, era where to be a respected restaurant chef, you had to make fancy food for rich people. But that's changed. And that has changed in large part because of people like you who have had the audacity to redefine the meaning of hospitality. 
which is a real yeah. thing you did, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you for helping us all feel confident um, following our personal dream and helping to build a world where our dream can come true, even if our dream isn't cooking for fancy people. Thank you. Roy Choi, everybody. Thank yeah. you. Round of applause. That's it. That's, That's the podcast. It. <laughs> what else do you all want me to say? <laughs> thank you for being on the podcast. Yeah, we'll thank see you later. <laughs> Wait, but I can't help but notice yeah. how much you guys have in common, first of all. We're both dressed in black. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Danny Boy's Pizza. Yeah. The Kogi truck, Tacos Por Vida. Like, this mm -hmm. is all, like you said, the everyman food. Right. Yeah. You, we all started out. We were just talking about the Culinary Institute of America. We're all graduates. Mm -hmm. We all started out in a white toque with a white coat and a neckerchief. And that was our path. Right. Mm -hmm. But then now what you've done, you've laid a path for other people to break that mold and do something completely different. And this is the kind of food you want to cook. You talk so much about making pizza and the price of food and feeding somebody like that's super important right now. And I think so much has changed since we started. All of us started. We were mm -hmm. just talking about being up in Poughkeepsie at Hyde Park. And now we're talking about, you know, food truck. You're being a founder of the food truck. You're cooking pizza every day. You know, this chef life is completely different. Completely different. But I think after a while, you had to break that mold and just mm -hmm. do something that you loved you know, cook what you love because there was no way you would survive without it. I think, you know, I don't think you could be as sustainable as you have been over all these years if you were trapped mm -hmm. and pigeonholed into that kitchen that way. Yeah, it, you know, it's very much like um, it reflects society a lot too, especially you see it in entertainment, podcasting, content creation. Uh, you know, the world in the in the food world, it very much like entertainment was controlled by a handful of people, mm -hmm. you know, and um, restaurants were controlled by investors, uh, entertainment was controlled by executives. Uh, but now, since things have been democratized through uh, technology, we all have a voice and we all have opinions and our ability to put ourselves out there. And, um, you know, before there, there was a, it was a linear ascension to what you had to do. You right. had to go through these gateways but now you ain't got you ain't got to kiss no fucking rings no more. That's you know, right. you can just do whatever you want to do. So um, that's an amazing thing. And food is food. You know, um, there are still some, you know, organizations that are still trapped in the past and are whole clinging on with their fingertips, you know, like Michelin and San right. Pellegrino, World's 50. Fuck those both of them, you know, right. because they don't recognize, um, you know, they don't recognize, uh, you know, what is important for for the people um it's still trapped in in its own cloak in its own you know veil but um oh, i think you've been embracing technology for so long yeah. like i remember in 2009 you know when i first met you mm -hmm. you, you could only find the kogi truck if you're on twitter yeah that was the only way and you know to think I honestly think about you as like the founder of that, you know, of that, of the yeah. food truck and of reaching people through social media to yeah. get them to eat your food. The only I thing I want to say is thank you for that. The yeah. only thing I want to say is not, I'm not, we're not the founders of the food truck because we, there is, there is a whole history before us. Right. You know, I look at us as like the children of our ancestors, right. you know, and our parents. And, um, you know, uh, food, immigrant food has existed f uh, in this country since immigration. So it all exists out there on the streets. It just wasn't written about in mainstream American media mm -hmm. or it wasn't acknowledged or um, honored. What we were able to do, again, if you look at it through the metaphor of the children, we were able to take our non-English speaking parents, the culture and the food that we grew up around, we were able to translate that to a larger American audience. Mm -hmm. And the way we were able to do that was through technology. And so through social media, really what we did was we just took everything that was already existing out there on the streets and we just kind of repackaged it and, and you know, put a different voice behind it. And um, everything changed, you know. Uh, you know, who could have ever predicted it? Because uh, that wasn't our plan when right. we started. Our what plan was, was just plan? To, our plan was just to make eight hundred bucks a night. That was <laughs> that, that was our plan. We were parking in front of the clubs at right. two a.m. and uh, our our like window of opportunity was 
from 2 to 4 a.m. If we could make 800 bucks, because we weren't selling anything before that. We were waiting for the That's clubs to get out. Yeah, two hours. And that was it. We were just trying to make 800 bucks, get to the next day, use 400 bucks to buy produce, pay our team, have maybe 100 bucks left, you know, and then just get to the next day. But, um, you know, I don't know. Something, something crazy happened and things started to change and then it became really deep. You know, and I everything. Don't think it was. I think from the beginning, it was it was special though. It was never like it was special, yeah. but it, it tasted special, and that's what possessed us. And right. that's no, what made I don't. Us go I think of. you tapped into the idea that mm -hmm. that food was like s s cooks were servants. You went through the back yeah. door. You yeah. you used the the back door entrance. You used the like you know employee bathroom mm -hmm. in the changing room, and then you dressed up in your fancy white you know all yeah. white clothing, and you were behind the kitchen, and maybe they got a little glimpse of you. And you were like, no, we are people. This is not how people eat or want right. to eat. This is not yeah. the the food was shifting out of the home and onto the street where people could 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 commune. I mean, I agree with that, and we knew something was special, but we couldn't we couldn't put the pieces together in the first few months, right? Because everything was happening in real time. Mm. But what did happen is it. I mean, if that's those feelings were deep inside, but we didn't know that this was going to be the avenue to be able to create a new philosophy of life. But what happened was um, when it started to get deep, it just, uh, it went from trying to make 800 bucks a night and trying to feed everyone on the streets to like it changing the language and the perception around how people view the food that we cook. Mm -hmm. Because things were being called roach coaches, trucks were being called dirty, you would get sick I mean, off in all, all fairness, these old, I grew horrible up in New jokes. York City where, you know, I've seen the Halal roaches come trucks. out of those. Coaches. You see roaches? <laughs> They're delicious, but I've seen a lot well, of roaches. roaches come out of restaurants, <laughs> too. Yes, you know? they do. That's, they come out of restaurants, too. You and know? they live in there. They don't always come well, I mean, out. I'm a big <laughs> fan of a, of a street dog. Like, you know, yeah. no, no. But, but, but that's uh, cool what you said because I remember because D and I go way back to when he was really young. We used to work at La Bernadette and we used to work in this huge, La Bernadette is on the bottom floor of this huge <laughs> office building. And on uh, 51st Street, yeah. um, and uh, we used to have to go in the back, down, yeah. down the stairs. The labyrinth. The labyrinth. And then yeah. we'd all get undressed. And everyone in the locker would have, room yeah. together. And then there was like yes. a little window where people could room see, together. It, see the natives in the kitchen. Yeah. Yes. You know, as they were cooking for them. But the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 I feel like. I don't know what I was going to say. Move on. Mm -hmm. You continue. Yourself. No, no. I just those are fun days, man. When we used to go down there, and we used to eat down there, and we all get changed together. It was, yeah, it was like we were like a basketball team. <laughs> it was. Like, I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think a lot of people really think yeah. about the locker room vibe of a restaurant. But I worked at Vong in 1991. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I was changing in the locker room with everybody I mean, else. I, that was just about to say that. Yeah. I think that all the. It's all dudes. All, the, yeah, all yeah. the dudes, but all the females changed with us, too. We were all, oh, yeah, we're all in the same room. Yeah, yeah we're but it the wasn't same like room. I was in my skivvies. I mean, I wore a T-shirt and underwear, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, but we all were... All the other cooks were in the... Yes. Were in the, were in the <laughs> oh, I wore... Yeah, no, I wore yeah. a banana hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Silk. That, what's his name? All Did the Latin guys. A silk. Juan and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone wants a thing. It's very comfortable. Yeah, but there was a dirty locker room vibe. And then if you were eating family meal, you turned over a milk crate and you're sitting in the in the dry storage or you're sitting next to the garbage it was such and a, you're eating. It was such and a civilization down there because then yes. all the captains would be counting their money. Yes. You know, in front of all the cooks yeah. who were barely surviving. Yes. And oh, my God. I had a crazy. rule. When I worked at Verbena, I had a rule because I used to work doubles on Sundays. Uh -huh. And all of our guys would work Saturday night and we'd all uh -huh. work doubles into Sunday. And the servers would come in in between brunch and dinner and count their yeah, cash in the, right in, in the kitchen. And I was like, you guys cannot. Yeah, you're not allowed to do yeah. that. You're not allowed to do that. Like, I just was like, I'm sorry. I was friendly with everybody, but I was like, you can't. Go do it we're tomorrow. losing cooks fast enough. Yeah. The last thing you go, need to do is oh, I used to love Verbena. Oh, wasn't that yeah, a great restaurant? That was a great restaurant. It was a gem. Um, and, you know, we tried to keep a really good uh -huh. culture there. And we, we wanted to make it feel like a yeah. family. And, but you don't come in and count your money in front of people who have worked 18 hours in a row and have no money. You know, it's what just... What were we making in New York as cooks back then? We were making like, like 400 bucks a week. Yeah, I made 525 an hour. 500 yeah. bucks I got, a week. And then I got yeah. up to six. Minimum 525 wage. 525 an hour was my beginning. So it must have yeah. been close to that. Like a dollar more than minimum I made two, wage. You probably made a lot more than me. You negotiated your... <laughs> I didn't negotiate nothing, man. <laughs> but when you talk about family and you talk about Kogi, I think that you're... Your customers, your guests, your clients are as much of the family as the people who cook with you. Yeah. I really feel that. Like the people who are your patrons, they are, I don't know, I think they feel a real connection to you. And I feel like yeah. 
just even looking at your social media, like mm-hmm. taking a picture every time of the first people yeah. online, like there's some, there's a connection. It's it it happened organically. I it's we're kind of like a jam band. Yeah, you know, we're like fish exactly. or widespread. You have such a loyal following. Yeah, we're like widespread panic. Like we just like <laughs> it, there's something about like um, and I see like uh, older rock bands like Alice Cooper and stuff like that that. The fans have stayed with them since yes. the 70s, and you see them grow with them the whole time. Um, I don't know, something like that. Like, we just started this taco pop-up, um, Tacos Por Vida, and the same people that were waiting in line in Kogi 15 years ago are coming out, with mixed with new people, but are coming out again. So it's, like, really great yes. to see those faces. Wow. Very and generous taco. <clears throat> a very delicious and generous Thank you. taco. Thank you. Um, but it, yeah, but there's also a culture and a vibe around it. A hundred percent. Yo, I think that... that we're also a, expressing ourselves in real time. Yes. I think that's what you were touching on in your soliloquy yeah, of yeah, my yeah, life, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> is that we're very honest and transparent with our audience and ourselves. And so, like, we're... Not only are, are is that honesty in the food, but we're also, like... Tacos Por Vida, we did the whole soft opening in real time with the public. So we were, it was almost like we were documenting and uh, going through all our mistakes, you know, out in the open yeah. with everyone. And that, you know, that's like that's a scary. Lot. And that's like practicing, you know, a Broadway show and showing the rehearsals yes. to the audience. You know, it's so vulnerable. It, yeah. But, it's, but the, the, the audience is, it's an audience participation show. On the Line podcast is brought to you by Danny Boy's famous original pizza. From downtown Los Angeles and Westwood, Los Angeles, Danny Boy's pizza started with a singular goal of producing the best slice of pizza that we could possibly create. We make New York style pizza with the finest ingredients, built by a team of fun-loving, like-minded, culinary-driven individuals producing slices of pizza that are not gonna empty your wallet, but they will fill your belly. Come down to Danny Boys and say hi. I am on the line, cooking them up for you, as well as on the line with Amanda Freitag. You're in the studio for you. It That's is. kind of the whole point. It's is almost that- like a... Um- like the Groundlings Theater or something. It's, it's like sketch comedy. And you've like taken yourself off of the pedestal and said, "Hey, we're part of the people. Mm-hmm. We are your we're we're peers, and we're mm-hmm. you know we're cooking for you, mm-hmm. but you're our guests, which means that we can we can kick you out if you're rude as well. Like we're we're part mm-hmm. of this as a team together, but it's which seemed- is a big difference between being like I'm making fancy food, mm-hmm. which was the only example that we kind of had. Like yeah. you come up, you got this example of you know, that white toke chef, and that's what you're aspiring to be. And then at some point you're like, I don't know, is this who I really am? Mm-hmm. And now thankful, thankfully to you and folks, you know, that have taken kind of that risk, you're like, oh, there's an option for me to go in either direction. But that doesn't necessarily mean you can't, you got to put in the work, right? You still got to put up, you, yeah. you still get judged by your food. And if it doesn't taste good, people aren't going to pay Well, Kogi it. happened after, you know, 15, 20 years of cooking. So then- right. You know, when you put in the work and then you go out and express yourself honestly, you have the foundation um, to be able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I see a lot of, especially now, because the downside of this democratization of expression is that a lot of people get into it too early. I'm glad you're talking about that. so what happens is they, because they have the opportunity, they can get famous or go viral Mm -hmm. overnight. Um, which is cool, man. Everyone should should do Shoot whatever they want to do. Shoot your shot, you know. Yeah. But what happens is they don't. There's no. There's no foundation for them to work off of. So once they get past a certain point, they start repeating the same thing, like the same sandwich or the same ASMR or all those things. Which, and if then, you're in Japan, you know, is great because you just you know you just make, make the same one sandwich forever, <laughs> forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Culturally, yeah, you just gotta be in the right country. Yeah. <laughs> but you need to have a whole base to pull from yeah. you know it's like your upbringing obviously your family had restaurants and different businesses yeah. you uh, love the fusion of mexican and korean you know but mm-hmm. of course you worked in french and you know global cuisine like you have something to pull from to get to those flavors you know and i think it's really just just talking about cia again being yeah. there like seeing these kids that are wide-eyed and hungry and wanting to know what they can do in the industry. And they all ask me, like, what do we do? What do we do? I'm like, yeah. work in a restaurant. Yeah. Work in a restaurant. Learn I don't care cook. what yeah. you're going to do. If you're going to be a food stylist, you're yeah. going to be a director of photography. I don't care. You're work t- in a restaurant. Well, back in our, our when we were coming up, 
I mean, I think the golden rule was seven years. You work seven years yeah. in a restaurant as a cook. Every year, year and a half, two years, are there like Beethoven's of food? Are there kids that just? I I wonder there about are. this. Like, are there people sure. that are really like have a perfect that, pitch and can cook right off the right I don't off know the if, bat? Uh, yeah. that I've seen it. You know, definitely on you know TikTok and YouTube. Other than me, obviously, yeah, <laughs> TikTok and YouTube. I mean, you started young too, so there are a lot of young. But I didn't know how to cook. I think it's a, definitely creators. a craft. You got to like learn how to. Well, they're able to absorb on their own in their room mm. through YouTube now. So they're able to practice, absorb, see, you know, which is great. And then yeah. they're able, when they put out their first video or when they first start, there there's already a well of of knowledge that they've absorbed through their eyes and 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 through their body. So um, maybe I, I I don't know. It's an interesting but, way to go about it because obviously you know. we just cooked food and served it to people, and yeah. that was it. Yeah. And now, you know, sometimes I think this generation, that young generation has it so much easier, but it's actually harder. Yeah. You have to know how to cook food. You have to know how to be comfortable yeah. in your skin and confident about it, and then it's all visual. It's all out there. It has to look good. You have to look good. You have to talk about it. You have to know how yeah. to put this together. So I think it's really almost more difficult. And you can get better. You know, I mean, you could start off, there probably are Beethovens that start off great, like whether it's jujitsu or f food or whatever. Right. Like someone can come out of the scene and be like extremely talented. Yeah. But that doesn't take away from the fact, like someone maybe could come out and be really good like at wrestling or jujitsu against you. But that doesn't mean that they can't learn more as they mm -hmm. go into it, you know? Right. Um, so you have like a natural proclivity. Yeah. You're 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 naturally predisposed to being good at it, and then the work you put in is just gonna. But the problem is sometimes they don't put in the work after they get yeah. famous. That's the only thing. That's the only criticism I have is yeah. that sometimes um, the learning can stop. That, that's what, what do you I was think about say. the famous yeah. versus the like your choice? Because you have you get to have the sorry you got yeah. you get to have the choice of like. Do I want to be a celebrity person or do I want to be a cook person? And you kind of, you kind of spend your time. It feels like from the outside cooking in the kitchens and cooking for the people. Are you mm -hmm. like, you know, when you have an opportunity to make money not working in a blue collar job, it's got to be very attractive. Um, well, you know, I've done TV and I've, I've, um, you know, done, I've written, you know, books and done other things, but. My main my main line is still cooking. It's still yeah. food. You know, um, it may not necessarily be opening the the biggest or most the, the most popular restaurants in town or whatever the case may be, or being like the uh, the one that's getting all the awards. But I'm always out there trying to cook, you know, for the people and for the fans, you know, and trying to open new things. Um, well, you know, I think that a lot goes of it is just learning, an art, right? Like, yeah, don't you want to just form, keep you know? learning? Like, I think our yeah. generation, and I know. I can speak for myself. Like, I just want to keep learning. Yeah. Like, that's why I love to travel so much, right? That's why we go to different restaurants mm -hmm. and different cultures so we can keep learning. I taught myself all this technology because I yeah. want to know. I don't yeah. want to be that person who's like, I don't know how to do it. Yeah, I know how to do it. You know, I don't want to sit back and say, okay, I'm done. You know, like. And you guys have now have the challenge of not just being chefs on TV, but being actual TV personalities, mm -hmm. which is a growth thing too, right? It's a growth thing being as well. Being unchopped and then like looking at yourself over time, over seasons, and really working on your camera, you know, Just even vocabulary. vocabulary, exactly. everything, you Describing know. Describing food. Yeah. You have to be articulate. Mm -hmm. You have to take a bite of something. And really, I think about what it would sound like to somebody and would it really resonate? Would it really tell them what it tasted like? But, you know, maybe it's why I'm not... <laughs> so hugely popular in the tv world is like i'm not an actress i've never mm. been that i'm just a chef and i'm passionate about food oh, and man, so you, you're the one like I, I, I don't watch chopped unless you a judge <laughs> thank you Shit. But fuck like, all the other judges you're the it's one it's no, funny because i still want the chef who's uh -huh. there competing yeah. to learn something yeah. like that's so when i give a judgment i want them to walk away learning something because yeah. i know when i compete which i can't believe i'm still doing it yeah. i still compete i don't know how y'all compete it's it's really hard compete. for the. Why heart. aren't you on those shows? I can't compete. I, I don't cook. It's quickly. really yeah. stressful. I don't like to cook quickly. It, it, but it, you, I learn something about myself every yeah. time I do it. Every time. Yeah. So I always want to say no, but when I say yes, as much as I hate it and the adrenaline yeah. makes me feel like I'm going to die, I learn something huh. every single time. That's cool. I can't do that. I, yeah. I, one, I don't want to beat anybody. 
And then the other thing is I don't like to lose. So I'm trapped between both. <laughs> so one, I don't like, I, I, I'm, there's like this like really yes. namaste side to me where I like, cooking is about like Losing sharing. Sucks. I don't want to be. I get it. And if I don't lose, I got knives. I'm like, I want to kill them. <laughs> yes, it really, honestly, it really sucks. I lose yeah. all the time. I'm like the Susan <laughs> Lucci of cooking competition, if anybody knows who she is. I don't know who um, that is. Who's that? Susan Lucci was a soap opera actress who yeah. was nominated for daytime Emmys oh, for like 20 years year. in a row and, and never won. Ever, not one. I think eventually she won one. Anyway, but I think what's great for me, and I I know this about you, is like any kind of media presence that propels you gives you the platform to help people, yeah. to do what you fu- really want to do, right? Like, so you're obviously community activist. You want to help. You want to give back. You've uh, done so many things that then bring you joy, right? There's only so much joy you can get from feeding people, and that... I think is our ultimate joy and we share that. But then when you're able to do something where you can help people, I think is the ultimate. I'm for me personally. And you do it in so many different ways with people who like kids who are struggling, communities who are struggling, people who need jobs and training. I mean, you've been doing that for a really long time and you still are. Yeah. It's a, it's a part of everything that I am. You know, it's the way I grew up. It's, the communities I come from, it's the people I still uh, interact with that mm-hmm. are my friends and family, you know. And so the way I look at it is I was lucky enough to be able to do whatever I do. Um, but I remember how it was being a kid yeah. like that, you know. So, you know, um, you got you, you got to be there for them. Um, it's Did not you? just a phrase of giving back. You got to like, right. you got to uh, interweave it. And it doesn't mean that you have to go back to community that you're not, connected with you could go back to whatever past you had but you have to uh, interweave it with who you are and just uh, make it a part I try to make it a part of a balance of every decision that we make so if we make like a business decision there has to be something community driven that balances that as well that's Um, that's the way to do it I mean mm -hmm. did your parents teach you that part I mean when I grew up both my parents worked Mm -hmm. grew up in a suburb that we didn't do a lot of charity stuff. We didn't mm-hmm. do a lot of philanthropy. It wasn't a part of our upbringing. I really got that through the chef community, oh, honestly. Yeah. Where'd you grow? I grew up in New Jersey, okay. in the suburbs. I think like it wasn't is like a Christian thing. Well, we also, yeah, we didn't yeah. have a lot of religion in our life and we didn't have a lot of money. So uh-huh. my parents, you know, you keep your money, you bank your money. There's a lot yeah. of work ethic. You work for your money. If you want something, you work for it. Yeah, you pay for it. Everyone for themselves. You just and, do and what you do. And that was it. Right? So I, yeah. I honestly learned about giving back yeah. <clears throat> through the chef community because then it would be, oh, my chef's going to do this benefit yeah. for City Harvest and yeah. I'm going to go s- sit behind the table and serve a thousand people. Like that's when I learned about it, really. We were never really on the philanthropy side because we didn't have money either. But the right. thing is that... Um, it was always community driven because as immigrants in this country, like sometimes all you got is each other, right. you know, or as minorities in this country, um, you know, you ha- a lot of people who aren't minorities in this country don't understand what it's like mm-hmm. going, growing up as a minority in this country because you have to live double lives. Yep. You know, you have the life that you are and how you look and your family and where you're from. Um, But then you have to go out into the regular world and get a job or go to school and interact with everyone else. Mm So, um, you know, those can be manifested in different ways, whether it was back in the day in your lunchbox or it could be not bringing anyone to your home or the way or being ridiculed or being yelled at or having racist things thrown at you out in public. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to absorb all that shit. And so then what happens is you band together. You band together within your own communities, and then you spend time together. You share together. That's a safe zone. Yeah, safe zone, but you also share. So that right. part of giving is that we're not in this alone. Right. And whatever you have, I can break off a piece for you and you, mm. and then we get go through it together. You know, usually those happen like on the weekends or you right. bring food over for everyone, and then you go back out there and you deal with all right. the bullshit in the world again. Um, I love that description yeah. of that because I think that anybody who's never experienced that doesn't yeah. understand, yeah. you know, that that's why, you know, immigrants want to stay together in their communities. It's safe and they share something and it's a different vibe, you know, yeah. and, but those are very generous communities that share food with other people that yeah. don't know. And like, this is how we learn about you. This is how we learn about Roy. This is how we learn about Dan. When you cook for us, you yeah. know, if that's how we learn about each other like that's to me is a great connection of food yeah um but that's got to be scary because people are not always open to it 
Yeah, and you know, food has definitely been a huge part, especially in the last 10, 20 years of building bridges, you mm-hmm. know, like because you know, the world was so fucked up in the 80s and 70s and 60s and 50s, you know, going yeah. back, you know, like, you know, um, the, the, you know, the root and the basis of this country is built off of horrible actions and racism and genocide, you know, so um, for now things to be changing and being, for someone to be able to see someone beyond the color of their skin through their food and then be, be interested in that food and then um, make it a part of their lives is, you know, it's a big step. It's, it's a baby step, but it's a big step yeah. towards changing things. Right. I get so frustrated um, sometimes that our industry is something that everybody wants to be a part of, right? Yeah. Every celebrity wants to have a cooking show, you know, every model wants yeah. to have a cookbook, but at the same time, it's kind of good. It's kind of yeah. good because if you do it right, like you, you can connect people that way mm. and you can bring people together that way. And, you know, I talk about the food network stuff, but you've had a huge impact um, through, you know, the chef movie, the chef show. How did you, I'm just going to ask huh? personally, how did you meet John Favreau? Um, how did you meet him? We was got, we got, uh, there was like a matchmaking situation. So he was, um, he was in pre-production for his movie. Uh-huh. And so at the final stages of like. For chef. They, for chef, the yeah. movie. Um, they had already written the script. They were in pre-production there figuring out all the logistics and details. And the last piece of it was that he had to actually learn how to cook. So they were looking for a teacher or a chef. Uh, And somehow my name came up. And it was supposed to be just a job. I always say, like, if he was doing a boxing movie or a wrestling movie. Yeah, he would train. You're the coach or whatever. I'm the coach. I go in for three weeks. I teach him different movements, and I'm gone, you know. Mm -hmm. But... um, we fell in love on the first day. <laughs> oh man. my god! Just I like love me it. and you, just like <laughs> like D and me, you know, like uh, we. Um, For anybody who's listening who's never seen it, there's yeah. a, an amazing movie. I've I've probably seen it about ten times. Called Chef with John Favreau and um, uh, Sofia Vergara is in that movie, right? Sofia Vergara, she? Scarlett Johansson, Scarlett Johansson, Dustin Hoffman. Oh, such a good uh, movie. John Leguizamo. Oh, I love him. Robert Downey Jr. I mean, yeah. this is this is so this is kind of a pivot, right? Like a change that happened. You did the movie with John. You guys became really mm. close, obviously. Yeah, from you day ha- ones, we were day like we the first day we met. We I had him meet me at one of my spots, and then I figured the it would be great to take him around on my routes. So right. at, at that time, I had a few different restaurants and the trucks out there, and my normal day would be going around and checking on all the spots, you know, you know, like we do sure. if you have multiple restaurants, you spend an hour in each spot. So I figured six hours, jump in the car, come with me on a normal route. And uh, we just bonded, man. We were just like two lost friends. And uh, huh. it be- then from that point, it just became more than a job. Right. I just... You were really involved we just in the making of the ended movie. Ended up hanging out, right? And um, even when I wasn't supposed to be there, I was there. Yeah. You know, and so. Um, and that was the yeah. very first time that you were on a movie set, like full Hollywood, right? Uh, yeah. Um, you had on done that, some on TV stuff. I had, I had some food. No, I had stuff. been. I didn't have a, my own show at that time, but I had done. I, I had been a guest on Anthony Bourdain's show right. by that time. That's right. That's um, right. And then I had done like early Food Network. Mm-hmm stuff where they because when kogi was like popping off yeah we did a uh, challenge of your truck yeah or there, would, there would be things like the unique eat show yes. or those type of things where yes. they would come in and do that I've type of a, stuff i've got a i've got a uh a video of you on on uh chilling and grilling with bobby flay <laughs> i was never on that yeah, show you were at the embassy yo oh, on yeah. outside I've, i found it in my yeah. in my house i've got it on a cd in my house i got it i love it that reaction amazing. i was never yeah. on that show oh, no, that, no, no that wasn't the uh, chill and grill it was he was out there for the um for like some, for the celebrity yes. golf championship and he's like 11 years old yeah. i'm like 10 <laughs> i'm like yeah. five you know yeah and then um it was early this was like 2001 oh yeah. wow bobby and lawrence came out for the yeah. uh so for, golf for the tournament? thing for the golf tournament and uh they were, I think he had just come out with his first line of sauces and spices at that time. And then he Holy was promoting shit. those. So they, we, they, somehow the tournament used our hotel as his home base. And they were filming something about it there. And, um, that and was I, was a, I was nobody. I was just like doing all the mise en place and <laughs> setting it up and then um, cooking with him. But uh, it was cool. That <laughs> it was, was the insa- yeah. I mean, Food Network had only started in like 98, I think. So yeah. that was early it on. Was, it was early, early, early yeah. days. Yeah. yeah. 
Absolutely. Actually, a friend of mine is the creator and producer of Unique Eats, Irene Wong. I don't know if you remember. I, I remember love Irene. That. Shout out yeah. Irene. Hey, yeah. Irene. Hi, Irene. Irene. Terribly talented. We miss you. Yes. And extremely meticulous. Is she I feel still like on TV? We, uh, she's doing some stuff, but nothing of her own anymore. That, um, that was great. I mean, she did a great you, you, job. We did Irene, that show was they, great. They for would. Us. They would do. She was like. She's an artist. Close ups over and over and over of each. Each step of the dish, I really respected it. That was the yeah. longest day yeah. of filming of my life. Remember that? With her. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. she's meticulous. Of and it also food. was very impactful for the business. Meticulous, yes. but not like annoying. No, because she yeah. respects the chefs. Yeah, it was like one and of those the artistry of it. You never rolled your eyes. You were like, "Yo, yeah, cool, yes, yeah. yes." She you know. makes everything you're doing look beautiful. Yeah, that everything. Was a great show. It was a great show. So um, anyway, so you started a little bit of the television stuff. Then boom, uh, you're like Hollywood movie set. Hollywood movie set. Yeah. And then indie movie set with John and all of these like legendary actors and cinematographers and producers. And everyone just um, and that's where food becomes a bridge. again. Yes. You know, like. It, you know, because a lot of times in Hollywood or any industry, people are just trying to get it, you know, like network or get ahead or anything but they knew that everyone was here for the art of the movie so it was um it was a very uh did you get even the... equal environment so like they let me get as far as i need as i could yeah. anywhere i needed to go you know what i mean and so you got the all access pass i because... got the all access pass and and i contributed and um and did you get the bug for it like did you want to yeah. do it again i mean it sounded like that was yeah. also a really beautiful bubble of people who cared and a wonderful experience. I'm sure not every movie set is like that, but well, it definitely, I got the bug. It opened up from that point. Then things, happened. cause up until then, um, even though I had been a guest on certain shows, I was, I was aware of it. One growing up here in LA and yeah. Hollywood, I, I had seen it my whole life. A lot of, uh, friends, mothers and parents worked at places like Paramount, sure. or, you know, it's a big industry. different studios. And th th yeah, it's our job, you know, like uh, people's jobs out here, whether they were grips or sound or, you know, camera or whatever. So I had, I had already <laughs> said crafty, I had already, yeah. already seen it. But also in the first, so we started filming that in 2013, Kogi started always. So for the first five years at Kogi, we were really popular as a catering truck in, in Hollywood yeah. for, for sets, whether they were lunch or wraps or anything, rap, uh, rap parties. And so I had been around it, but after the movie, yeah, I got a bug. And, and it's weird how when sometimes um, something affects you like that, the, if you manifest it, life follows that mm -hmm. way. After that, I had gotten a couple offers to do shows. Mm -hmm. And then I started, um, then I came out with our book, L.A. Sun. Yeah. And after that, I had been approached for a lot of, um, pitching a lot of scripted versions of that, so of the story. So then all of a sudden, I'm all up in the mix. And, yeah. Still never got, I got non-scripted shows uh, to the screen, but I never got a scripted show to the screen. Do you still want to do it? I'm still trying, man. Hollywood's yeah. hard as fuck. Hollywood yeah. takes forever. You know, what I learned in Hollywood is, because in our industry, in, in food, if you say there's a table for two and I'm cooking for you, like you're in, right? right. Like you're, you're in. But in Hollywood, when they buy something, it's only the first stage. And that shit threw me for a loop. Yeah. Because... As cooks, we just like honesty and yes. we like straightforwardness. And but I know the industries are different, but it it, it no, messes with your mind. Five shows and nothing There's ever sees so, so the yeah. idea of the word you sell yeah. something like in my mind as a cook is like we made an yeah. agreement. It's you done. tell all your friends, I'm yeah. so excited about this thing. You got a table. Yo, yeah, and right. now and and by the way, this is my livelihood. So yeah. right, like, I'm and if you work it. hard, yeah. you'll get the reward. But it's yeah. not like that in no, Hollywood. No, because then I learned the difference between uh, selling something and green lighting something, yes. and that was a, that was the whole thing I learned. In, in, in <laughs> let, let me ask you, it's um, a big difference. Do you think that the same way that the food truck kind of brings the food out of the restaurant and onto the street? Is that, you know, where social media is taking the entertainment industry where you see like, you know, do people go still to the Food Network to get their 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 food information or are people looking on Instagram and Twitter and and TikTok? And, and is that is that like a viable, realistic? Well, I don't think the Food Network is the driver of food content anymore you not know, anymore like, i don't think it's the main source um it was it, for a long time it was for a while for a until until social media came about until yeah. technology moved things i don't think that's the fault of food network but it's not it's not what the youth are watching you know um 
it's funny how the network has become like the Guy Fieri network. You know, yeah. it's like Absolutely. it's like uh, it's like Rob Diedrich on the uh, um, um, MTV. It's like you look at the channel <laughs> yes. thing; it's like all ridiculousness. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah. like, you look at Blue all Guy Fieri shows. So true. Uh, but I, you know, I think it's still there and it's still making an impact. Obviously, with the the way they're pushing all these new competition shows and stuff but um but it's not the thing people watch tiktok right now you know yeah so they know the... what they want and they find it that's the thing yeah. about this generation they don't just turn it on i always compare food network to mtv for my yeah. generation it's like yeah. we would turn mtv on we'd leave it on and some people yeah got into music and some didn't uh the kids that watched us coming up like yeah. food network early days they'll say to me you yeah. taught us how to cook well food network taught me right or actually was the thing that got me into cooking. Yeah. Because even though I'd been around food, um, I was at the really low point in my life, and it was the Emerald. Remember Emerald's first That's show? That's right, yes. The one where he was in the kitchen, yes. in a checkerbox kitchen? Yes. It was that show that I was like, wow, there's something. Like, I need to go into this world. Then I started, like, going down this rabbit hole. and um, That's amazing, yeah. though. Like, if you, you weren't on a great path and you yeah. saw somebody – in the boob tube, you know, mm -hmm. you saw this guy Emerald, and you're mm -hmm. like, wait, I, I could do that. Yeah. That's an incredible influence, you it know. It's huge, yeah. We talk about what it is today, and it's like, well, maybe somebody sees it on their phone. I don't know. Yeah. Wait, I want to check the time because I don't want to run out of time. We've got three minutes and 17 seconds. Okay, wait, then then oh, we... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can go a little bit longer. Wait, no, no, move but... my alarm to... Uh... So, but... <laughs> Actually, I have a little. Oh. As long as let's keep yeah. going to the end. Oh, wait, I, I just wanna... have a thing um, at eleven fifteen. As long no, as no, we will get you out. I'll on go time. to eleven ten. But I'll there's so much I want to talk to you about. You, yeah, you have a new book coming out. Uh -huh. Can I you do. talk about it? I do. Yeah. Uh, and I love I the title. About that. Can it's you been, tell us about the title? It's been so long. But shout out to Clarkson Potter. I love y'all. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been working on this book for a while. It went through a couple of rewrites. It actually, the direction of the book was going to be one thing, and then um, with. You know, the amazing commitment and work with our editor, Jen, and our team, we pivoted halfway through. Like, we were already, like, a year and a half into the book, and we were just like, You're almost you know, there. Well, what happened was COVID and all these things. Yes. And like, oh, yes. We, the book just didn't, it didn't read the same anymore as it. when we started it, you know. Yep. And and for anyone that's listening or watching, like, books take a long time. It's, it's like. Thank um, you for saying that. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy because you. You have this idea and you have this like really salient message and something's pulsating, but then you also have to think about this thing is not going to come out for three, yeah, two, two, three, three years. four years, like yeah. an album. And so you have to think about like, is it still makes sense? Is this is still a relevant, a relevant topic? thing yeah. back out there? So we were, half, at it. we were halfway yeah. through and it was like, just doesn't really nope. resonate anymore. It felt because, you know, it, we started it during COVID and I was like, these were the feelings I was having at that moment, of but course. then reading it like a year and a half later, I was like, ah, Very this is fucking stupid. <laughs> and then, uh, On the Line podcast is brought to you by Freitag Cocktails. I'm so excited about these, Freitag, that's me. Friday in German, hello, Friday's a great day for a cocktail. We make them in a family owned distillery in San Diego, chef crafted cocktails, our own bitters, our own vermouth. We make Manhattan, Negroni, Margarita, what else could you ask for? Go to frytagcocktails.com, order them today, and they'll be delivered to your door. Cheers! And so we pivoted, and so the book is taking like three and a half years to come out, but um, it'll be out next year. Great. Um, it's called The Choy of Cooking. The Choy of Cooking! Yeah. It's the best title <laughs> Thank ever! You. Come and on! And it's turning into the dream of the book. I mean, it's a it's a straight-up cookbook. Um, it's my first like straight-up yeah. cookbook, because the first book was a memoir. But the dream of the book is kind of, you know, because the name is so powerful, I want it to live, you know, for a long time. Yes. I want the recipe. So so that's where things started to pivot. I was like, okay, we have to look at these recipes and this book in like an evergreen way. Mm -hmm. And so, so the, the imagery I had was what if in 300 years from now, someone's at the Rose Bowl flea market and they're mm. sifting through a box and they pick up this book, The Joy of Cooking. Like, will it still resonate to this person 300 years from now? So we started, like, thinking, like, that became our North Star of, like, how to make this book. And that's a legacy. Yeah, and I wanted to make these recipes so that they could exist over time. They could make a difference in your life. I don't know what it is about life, when you, you know? write a cookbook and you put it in print. <sighs> it feels so permanent. Yeah. And it feels like I'm so scared of embarrassing myself by 
by putting something out there that isn't correct. Yeah. I don't, everything in my life, I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, it's you do your yeah. best, and then you're judged or not, and it's okay. It's a fleeting moment, but there's something about the permanence of a. Yes. Well, the, you know, book. the thing is, um, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but people really read the recipes. They that's, do. That's oh my god! Because yes. we as cooks don't really yeah. read the no, recipes. Of course I don't not. know if y'all know. We don't really no. read. We I'll go out notes read the that recipe. are like, "Yo, yeah. I made your mushroom gravy and it yeah. was salty." Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, "Wow, I always, thank you." I wanted to write a cookbook where it's like you put the ingredients and then you make that bracket yeah. and you write yeah. BTB, like yeah. bring to a boil. Like I just yeah. always wanted to write like a chef's cookbook that way, but yeah. you know, editors don't like that. And it yeah, they really like people who use our cookbooks. They really read them and they follow them to a T. So it is important to to believe in that permanence you know yeah. because it does matter like but because we're professionals what happens for us is we just glance over it and then we register that and then we go cook you know yeah. um but uh we don't look back at the recipe and say oh a cup like this a lot of pressure like, yeah. it's a lot of pressure i just thought it's uh -huh. that same thing you don't want to put anything out there that's permanent that doesn't work yeah you know a biscuit recipe or a cake yeah. recipe that's care, never gonna work there if are you people care. that can like well, you know, make lots. Of, that's been my problem for my whole life is that I, for whatever reason, I care. You know? I love that you said that. Dan cares. <laughs> Dan like, cares. We care. We Dan all cares. care. In this I don't know why. But Dan like, why cares. do you keep on opening restaurants? Like, why are we sitting here doing like, I don't know why I'm driven to give a shit. It would be so much easier if I could just put some garbage in. And I mean, that would be great. No, and just get don't paid do for that. It. Don't oh do God. it. And I love what Roy <laughs> said too. Like a book takes two, three, four years. I remember meeting this woman who had this gorgeous book. It was a Nordic cookbook. And, and I was yeah. saying, oh, I've been playing with wanting to do something. And she's like, well, it takes at least two years to make a good book. Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, there's people that churn and burn, yeah. right, books. But you you care. You, you know care what, you about know what, you know what, ours, ours is coming out next. Uh, the, it's 2024. It's coming out spring of 25. So how many years we is that between we your it, first we book? We pitched it. Oh, between the first book, uh, when it comes out, will be... Um, 12 years 12 years i had a 10 year writer to block. write another book yeah. and then and the 10 years writer <laughs> block which i think everybody understands but mm. also it'll take you four years for that book yeah. to have from inception you get, you, to you now you need at least one year because the normal pattern is as you all know is when you sign a contract for a book you get one year to write it yeah. but sometimes it takes a little more than one year but you get one year to write it and then the publisher needs one year to put it together because mm -hmm. they have to edit it they have to do the art they have to do the photography you have to they have to grow the children to type that and print it <laughs> yeah. overseas when they can <laughs> it does go overseas get the so. profits. <laughs> yeah. but um, it's it, it really does take a lot of time and yeah. like you said 10 yeah, years but the other thing is not just the time of the the real situation is like i wrote a cookbook right i spent however much time developing these recipes and this point of view concepts and then people are like, yo, that cookbook's great. Now write another cookbook. Yes. And I'm like, okay, well, I, I, I don't have 100 don't recipes. Have like, I can just copy some crap off the internet and right. put it out there. But if you really want me to put... It's like Malcolm Gladwell's first book is a spectacular book. His second book comes out five years later. It's like, now he's written like nine books. I'm like, you think he's got that many great ideas? What is this guy? Like the most prolific genius on earth? Maybe. But, you know, the first book is, is more special than the last. Right. Like, sorry, buddy. Yeah. No, but I love that you guys said that because it makes me feel Malcolm a little Gladwell better. Slipping. Yo, <laughs> just slipping. saying, the tipping slipping. point tipped. I hope he's listening. <laughs> um, but anyway, so before we let you go, let's talk about Tacos Por Vida. Like okay. you're you're taking that to Stagecoach this weekend. Is that going to happen there? Uh, Kogi will be at Stagecoach this Kogi weekend. Will be at Stagecoach. Uh, and... Tacos Por Vida has taken a three week hiatus because we had to do Coachella and Stagecoach, which takes our whole team. Sure. You know, it's a whole Herculean effort to get out there and do our thing. And then, but we'll be back May 2nd, um, beginning of May. And then I think we'll be back for good. You know, yeah. it was a pop-up for the first, because again, it, it worked. It just happened. It happened on the whim. It worked. And we were working everything out in real time. Um, we didn't want to make any promises, you know, um, but it worked. And so now we figured it out. And I think we're going to go open for real. And you know, for the locals and for the people who are listening, uh, how does it work? Where will it be? Have you been? So, Damn. so I've I've was been there, there the first night, yeah. and you know, for there's a shift that happened in L.A. Like the food truck thing, you developed that. It was you know really helped to make it a thing spectacular, out of the restaurant onto the street. But 
you go to Mexico City and the tacos are on the street. They yeah. set it up right in front of you, and there's a real connection between the person. And I noticed that shift happen in L.A. Uh, yeah. a couple of years ago. You start to see these pop up where people are taking their truck, driving, unloading, unpacking, and putting the food popping on the up grill. a six foot Big table, grill on the street, smoke coming up, you know, over charcoal. Yeah. And it's like really special. You're really connecting yeah. directly with the with the person. They hand you your food. It's not like down from the truck. You're like so. There's no truck. It's just no truck. It's on the street, just like he's describing. Yeah. It's um the the concept, the idea of it was to do live fire backyard backyard barbecue grilling over mesquite. Um, do like uh, just strip it all the way down to the the basic most. Uh, core forms of food that we grew up around, carne asada, al pastor, mm. pollo asado, and then um, doing Sorry. handmade tortillas. So really it's handmade tortillas, the uh, the meats and marinades we grew up around, and then um, live fire. Wow. And just being out there. Are you music, allowed chilling. to just do that? I mean, is, if I'm like, if I'm like, yo, I make these amazing like onion marinated grilled uh -huh. lamb kebabs can i just go out on the street and sell them how does that work you can yeah and then if so you, you don't, get if you don't and get, caught, get busted yeah. <laughs> everything's legal in jersey Roy says you can yeah, do yeah, it everything's legal till you get caught right? <laughs> shit. shit i mean is it the health of, i just don't understand because it feels so like visceral it's and so free rogue and, yeah. i love it i don't have the answer to that we just doing it we just yeah. all what we try to use is our own measurement as uh, uh of cleanliness and and you know, like honesty to, 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 you know, as a chef, you mm -hmm. know, I'm a trained chef. So like, we just try to be clean, organized, have our mise en place, you know, everything on ice. So our, far, I've never killed yeah, anybody. Yeah, our hot, <laughs> food, I know our, hot food, our hot food's hot and our cold food's cold. <laughs> but we do have a license to operate, yeah. you know, um, uh, and we're on private property. So, oh, so that's that, that helps a little bit too. And everyone just loves our And you're in the same stuff. spot. Each right time. now, again, we're still a baby, so we right. don't know where it's going to go. Like the thing about Kogi is, we have a history of going all throughout this county in Orange County, and we have so many different locations of loyal right. fans. So our dream is to start bringing it around to everybody. Um, but for now, tell everybody where it's going to be. Oh, uh, we're on Overland thirty four thirty four Overland nice. Avenue uh, in West LA, in the city of Palms, just down the block from my house. Which is thank you. Yeah, Thank he did for it that. for you, Dan. Yeah, I really appreciate you. it. <laughs> it's for you, but it's fun, man. It's fun cooking. I haven't opened anything new in LA in seven years. Wow. So, in seven years, so much has changed in the food world. All the stuff yes. we've been talking about on this podcast. You know, there was no content creators. There were no ASMR chefs. There was no TikTok. There was no nothing. So, um, so much has changed. There's a whole new audience, and I just felt like it was time to maybe reintroduce the culture of Kogi in a new way. Uh, waiting outside, you know, like people think waiting sucks. It does, but there are oh, certain, man, that's but the there, community. but there are certain things where waiting is fun. Like where yes. when you're waiting for a roller coaster, yep. or where you're waiting for. Uh, Have food. you been to those Texas, like Austin, Texas barbecue Austin, spots? Texas bar yes. They give out beer online, and it's like that's what I'm saying. It's like, part of the whole situation. It's fun. And by the way, I remember going to Kogi and thinking, yeah. like, you spend 150 dollars for a three hour meal at yeah. this fancy restaurant, or. You get a three-hour meal at Kogi. It's two and a half hours away in the line, but it's ten dollars, and it's the same feeling. But you're surrounded by like-minded people that are. But think all about excited. like, let's say you want to catch up on podcasts. Yeah. On this podcast. Yes. You, you haven't. You want to get up on it. You could wait in line, and listen to all of them. Yeah. You could get stoned. Yeah. You could hang out. You could just be you're in outside, line. You're outside. You're outside, and so people, everyone really buys into that. And I, I didn't know if this new generation was going to like vibe with that, yes. but they did. I'm and so that's happy why, to hear that. That's why Tacos Pavita took off. Um, but it's also going back to like uh, cooking like one thing again. Yeah. You know, and I know in the chef world, in the European mindset, um, it's like you got to be a, you got to be fancy and proficient. You've been talking about it this whole podcast, right. fancy and proficient and everything. But we were joking about Japan. But like, I think as I get older and I grow as a cook, all I want to do is be good at like one cook thing. like one thing the rest of my life, you yeah. know, like. Those those cooks that cook those om rices like that's all oh they God, do over amazing. and over again. But every single one is like you know, I've been, the I've been best talking it can about be making all pizza. The time. It's an art, and every yeah. time I throw a pizza in the oven, it's like almost perfect. Yeah. It feels so special to do. Right? It. And but there's always it's never perfect. It's like almost there, almost there. And then every time you get to you get to you get a little bit better, and it can be just as fulfilling if you if you reset yourself. My my uncle Barry, you know my uncle Barry. Yeah. My uncle Barry spent his whole life. He was a he was a, a carpenter. 
Yeah. And then he was a, 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 a cabinet maker and he started a general contracting business yeah. so he could make money and he built his, you know, his life in Manhattan and he did well uh -huh. and he grew it. And then finally he retired and he built himself a little shop in his garage yeah. and he called me the other day and he was like, did I tell you this already? No. He called me the other day and he was like, you know, I spent my whole life trying to make money so that I could blah, 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 and, and get where I was to eventually be able to retire and do the thing that I started out wanting to do, which mm -hmm. is just like one just build stuff build in my stuff. cabinet yeah. shop, in my garage. Like, And you can have that from the beginning. Have it from the beginning. If your dream, you know, we all want to have enough money to like, it's the American dream to have enough money to live, but the American dream isn't to be like a billionaire. You don't need extra yeah. money. That's just getting in the way of your happiness. And it's I, lucky though. Sometimes you, but sometimes we have to go through all those steps to get back to that place. Sure. But, but, there's some people that are able to find it really early, like the sushi chefs and like the, like the pasta, you know, grandmas mm -hmm. in Italy or or whatever. Like they're just making this like one thing for like seventy years, <laughs> yes. yeah. and it never changes. And, and they're like, fine with it. And they're fine. They're with happy it. with yeah. it. Yeah, they make it with lots of love every day. But and I'm really glad that the pendulum has swung back, yeah. and that this generation, seven years later, is is embracing what you're mm -hmm. doing. That you feel good about it because I'm not, sometimes I get a little jaded. I'm like, they don't under, understand, but yeah. I think they do. And I think there's a real community that's coming back. And thank you for continuing to do what you do. Because if thank it you. wasn't for people like you, I think I I personally would get a little lost in, yeah. you know, what it was that made it so special for us in the beginning and what the future is of food, you know. And I think we've come to find after talking to many yeah. chefs like you, the future's bright. The future is Ooh. bright. A return to craft by Amanda Freitag. But for yeah. real, because I get a little lost. And then when I go and see the students, I'm like, wow, they're really excited they are. to go into this world. Maybe it's very different than what I was doing, yeah. you know. And But just to know that you still care. There's yeah. care that's care. still going on, but that people are responding to that. Yeah. And they get you. So we got to go. We got to we gotta uh, wrap it up. Yeah, we got two minutes. You got anything else to say? <laughs> I am, so um, much to say. I just yeah, wanna I wanna wait, give a, a wait, quick wait. shout out. Uh -huh. Embarrassing enough, but there was a time when Roy turned um turned down Oprah Winfrey on an interview. So I just wanna say that not oh, that we're I? more famous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were famous for that. You were like, yeah, no, I don't have time for that. <laughs> fuck, fuck the Illuminati, <laughs> man. So just not that not that I'm Oprah, but you know, just thank you for Shit. that. Maybe you you know, next Oprah right yeah, It's all I... it's all coming out now, man. You know what I'm saying? Like you uh, see it. <laughs> honestly, I mean the the best part about doing this is not only do I get to sit in a room with Dan, yeah, but I get uh -huh. to sit in a room with people like you and talk to you thank and you. it re inspires me every time. Congratulations on this podcast. Oh, thank you. This is this is it was kind of random, but it made sense. Like when right. I saw you guys together yeah. doing the thing, and there's a connection. I love your whole tagline. AF. Thank you. you yes, know? I finally found out that I was is cool. There a, is there a book called? It should be called Easy AF. Is Dude, it called Easy AF? I'm working on it. All right, that Easy proposal, AF. Should, right. That proposal was sitting on my desk since okay. before COVID, All and right. I keep looking at it. I'm doing the same thing you do, and I'm like, okay. is this still relevant? Do people still want this? Yeah. Easy do. AF would be a huge it's gotta happen yeah, it's gotta happen it's gotta happen so you just inspired me today oh. to to push it forward so thank you for being here i can't thank you enough the joy of cooking i can't wait for that to come out yes um and we're just gonna follow you and and keep loving what you're doing thank you all and keep doing what you're doing i will follow you on twitter okay please <laughs> just follow him around town yeah. <laughs> and thank you all. thank you thank you okay. Woo! Season two of On The Line was recorded in Santa Monica, California at Operation Podcast. Thanks, Chase. Our engineer and editor is Matthew Donahue. Our theme song is an original composition by John DeLucci. Thanks, Chef. On The Line is produced by Cindy Augustine. Our co-producer and publicist is Jesse Gerstein. Our social media and marketing guru is Kedzie Teller. Thanks for listening to On The Line.